Sante Sana. So welcome everyone from all continents. Uh, this is a series of uh, webinars as uh, Kenya Healthcare Federation. My name is Dr. Wala Elizabeth. I'm the Vice Chair of Kenya Healthcare Federation. We appreciate that you have joined us. It's going to be an hour into this session and what we are covering today is uh, what are the latest developments regarding COVID-19 or coronavirus in Kenya and generally the global perspective. And then we focus on hospital preparedness. So we've had a couple of sessions before. Uh, one was focusing on testing and the other one was an overview of what we've been doing as private sector. Now I'd like to introduce you to I'll be the moderator for this session. I'd like to introduce you to the team that's behind the Projects Management Office. We have uh, Dr. Amit Saka on your left, top left, uh, being the chair of the Kenya Healthcare Federation, leading the team. I am his vice. And to your right, the right is Dr. Anastasia Nyalita, who is our chief executive officer. As a team, of the executive, we have come together through six work streams that are being supported by various chairs, uh, depending on the expertise of our membership. So we have supply chain on your left, that's handled by Vinod Guptan. We have healthcare financing that's handled by Njoki Fernandez. We have ICT and mobile health that's handled by Turuti Murigi. We have partnerships, communications, and resource mobilization by Anne Musava. We have healthcare regulations, quality and standards by Millicent Olulo. And we have human resources for health by Kate Auma. I'll just give you briefly that these work streams are, are going together towards, please go back one slide. So we are looking at tackling various issues that are affecting the private sector directly or indirectly and areas where we can complement the work of the government. So today's meeting that is focusing on hospital preparedness will basically fall under the, uh, it will be cross-cutting because within the hospitals there'll be the supply chain, there'll be hospitals looking at digital health space, there's the money beat on who's going to fund hospitals, there's the partnerships, they're the people who work there, that's the human resources, and then the quality and standards. So this is a topic that's cutting across all the six work streams. So next slide is focusing on the outline of the meeting today. I was, and I've given the all, welcome and opening remarks. I have uh, Mills Schenk from Boston Consulting Group, who are our partners in uh, regards to this um, COVID-19 response for private sector, and we appreciate the work they're doing. He's going to talk to us about the numbers, uh, both globally and locally. And then we'll have Matthew, still from uh, Boston Consulting Group, talking to us about uh, health response, including hospital preparedness, followed by Dr. Amit Thaka, looking at the Kenyan context, and then we'll have a question and answer session. So there's just a couple of rules that I'd like to take you through. On the bottom part of your screens, so this webinar has had everyone muted except the panelists, and, but you have a chance to communicate with us if you're, so you don't have an option of muting because we've already muted you, but we have a chat right there at the bottom called the Q&A. You can open the chat and ask a question as the presentation is going on. Someone is ready to answer or collect the information as we go ahead with the presentation. You also have the option of chats. So the chat session can be pretty busy, but uh, we will as, try as much as possible to collect the information as it comes in. And at the end of the presentation, we will direct your questions or comments to the panelists as they come. So we hope to keep you here for just exactly one hour. This is a recorded session. It will be uploaded on our YouTube channel as soon as it becomes ready. Thank you for that. And I want to welcome Mills to take us through the next session. Welcome Mills. I think uh, Pan Sisi will take us through this uh, session rather than Mills. Is that true? 
Uh, yes, Mills is uh, unable to be, he's on, but he's not unmuted. So if uh, he's able to be unmuted, that would be great. If he's not, I'm happy to start right now in the interest of time. So just a yes. quick check over Go to ahead, our moderator. Yes. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, what you're seeing here is uh, case trajectories across a sampling of different countries in Asia, US, EU, as well as um, you know, other parts of the world, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa. What you'll see is different case trajectories by country over the course of their um, COVID journey. And there are some preliminary signs that containment measures may be starting to flatten curves. You see South Korea that has very rigorous testing capacity of 18 to 20,000 tests a day. When they instituted a lot of their early testing and rigorous surveillance, they were able to flatten the curve. We see some bending of shapes in, you know, Italy, UK, US, though verdict remains to be seen. And when you look at some of those countries where the first COVID case was identified a bit later, so Brazil, South Africa, and Kenya to the left, um, also some early signs that very intensive measures such as the lockdown in South Africa perhaps has started to change the shape of the trajectory. So these are preliminary signs. We know that any gains are still tenuous at this point. And we also know that disease recurrence still remains a question, right? So in Singapore, where they had a good hold on what they thought was case trajectory, there's some uh, notion of a second wave in Hong Kong as well. There's also a second wave and new containment measures have uh, also been put down again to, to once again slow it down. So something to really keep in mind. Um, if we look at the East Africa region specifically, um, we see some interesting trends. So we know that in Rwanda and Kenya, there have been very intensive containment measures. So things like, um, you know, lockdown or closure of public spaces. And we also know that there is, you know, a concerted effort to do testing. And at least for Kenya, we can speak to that, you know, much more clearly. And there is some indication that you know, perhaps this is bending the shape of the curve, maybe getting things a bit, uh, getting a better picture of what's going on, though, um, again, still tenuous. What we do see in Tanzania, Ethiopia, Uganda, and Burundi is, you know, a lower number of cases, but it is uncertain uh, without knowing the testing data and having visibility, whether these are true um, reflection of the cases or whether this is just lack of testing. And in fact, um, there is correlation that if you don't test, of course, you can't find cases. Um, and then one more view of Kenya specifically. So we do try to track the situation daily here using the available data. And one thing to note is that, um, you know, if you look on the bottom left corner, no surprise to anyone, the hotspots are certainly in Nairobi and Mombasa. And if you look to the right, one thing to note is that on March 29th, that's when mass testing of people in quarantine at least started in Kenya. So that's where you really see the rates pick up and you see the positivity uh, rate every day. So this is a view that's going to be increasingly important in the coming weeks to make sure we have a good handle on the situation here and hopefully in our neighboring countries. Great. Thank you, uh, Cece. Um, Dr. Walla, you can introduce Matthew then to take over. Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Amit. So Matthew, please uh, go ahead and good morning from Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Um, I, I would like to share with you a number of learnings of what is happening around the world. Um, all governments, uh, all healthcare professionals, but I would say, you know, any professional, you know, is thinking, you know, through the crisis, you know, and how to handle the crisis. If we, if we stay at the macro level, you know, which is the slide that we have here, um, you know, there are at least four elements that are fundamental in the, in the answer. There is the epi epidemiological scenarios, the medical response, the economic, financial, and social scenarios, um, and then the government policy and the economic stimulus that you know, they, could, they could put. What do we mean by that? Um, the disease, as you can imagine, you know, I mean, really starts uh, with the virus spread, the health outcomes, and it is very important to have a clear understanding of, you know, what is going on in the country at the macro level. Um, 
I think the numbers that were just shared by CC, um, you know, honestly, for me, it is hard to analyze them. Um, are we in a situation, you know, do we see very good news where we're saying, well, you know, it, it is fantastic because the spreading of the disease in Africa is not as bad as we thought it would be 10 days ago. Um, we're in a situation where, you know, maybe the lockdown, you know, was taken more seriously earlier than uh, in Europe, let's say. And, and basically, you know, we have um, a, a spread that is much slower, uh, or we could say the population is much younger. So, you know, that does help, you know, maybe there's something with the temperature. You know, we don't know the answer, but, you know, obviously what we're observing now is very different from what we have observed in, um, in Europe a few weeks ago. One may argue that, well, actually, you know, we don't have the real data and maybe the, the reality is worse than that. You know, we don't do enough testing. So basically, we don't know what we don't know. Um, just as a reminder, you know, the number that were published by WHO this morning were showing um, that there were um, uh, 5,000 tests available in Nigeria for a population of 190 million. So I think, you know, it, when you look at the numbers in Nigeria, you know, it is probably very hard to have a clear understanding of the number of cases. The number of deaths, you know, maybe one may argue that, you know, we have a good level of certainty, but certainly not on the on the number of, uh, of cases. If we could just move to the previous slide, because, um, you know, I think that was, I was just describing the ep epidemiological scenario, um, you know, that are very important because, you know, everything starts from there. Um, you know, if you want to be ready for the medical response, um, have a better understanding of how do I increase the capacity? How do I make sure that I have enough um, ICU beds, ventilators, um, uh, protective equipment, uh, but also, you know, the uh, healthier workers, you know, to help manage the patients. And how do I, you know, also uh, identify my patients? So, you know, do I have the capability and the capacity? So the medical response, you know, is obviously the most important and will be the most important for you. But in order to have a proper medical response, you need to have a good understanding of what may happen in the coming weeks. So that's where the epidemiological scenarios that were just before, you know, were also important. And that medical response, um, uh, especially when it's combined with the non-pharmaceutical um, interventions, such as the lockdown, for example, they do have an impact on the economy of the country. They do have an impact on the job losses, the GDP, the business closure. It also has I mean, a very important social implication. You know, we know that the lockdown is very hard for the population anywhere in the world, and most probably you know, for the poorest um, member of the population. So it is very important to keep that in mind because there's no way the government can only make decisions based on the medical response. The way I've always been describing that is actually the government is trying to find the right balance between the medical response, the social response, so the ability of the population to accept either the lockdown or the number of deaths or the confinement and the quarantine for the people you know, that are um, uh, extracted from the population and placed in confinement, but also the, the, the social dimension. So uh, finding the balance between those three dimension um, medical, social, and economic is, is extremely important. And then, you know, you can refine the details uh, on agriculture, on retail, or on travel. Um, and obviously, the government policies, you know, are, are extremely important. Uh, we had in Europe yesterday the, the presentation, uh, I mean, a very speech, very formal speech from the French president. And you could see that his answer was the political answer. It was not just a medical answer. Um, because again, you know, healthcare, as we all know, you know, is, is part of a system um, that is extremely important. So when we get to what does that mean in terms of medical response, you know, which is the, the slide that we have now have on the screen, and we probably can stay on that slide for, for, the, for the next um, eight or nine minutes. Um, the response has been discussed, uh, sorry, uh, described as flatten fight future. So basically flattening the curve, um, we know that if you don't do anything, you're going to have a peak with a massive number of people coming to, um, to the hospital. And that most likely there's not a single health system in the world that is able to absorb that wave of patients. So that's why you want to flatten the curve just so that, you know, it can go, the curve can go below um, the system um, capacity uh, and ability to, 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 to respond and ability to treat the patients. Um, 
So in order to flatten the curve, um, I mean, you, need, you need to do things. You need to prepare that, and then you need to respond. Um, what do we mean by preparing? Um, the first thing is you need to be able to do testing. Um, uh, Tedros, uh, the DG of the WHO, has been very clear in his messages. You know, it's about testing, 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 testing. You need to know precisely where you stand, and you need to be able to do some triage. Um, and it could be massive testing, it could be testing of cases, uh, it could be tr tr uh, tracing and testing the contact that has been in, in, uh, in relationship with the, with the patient. But it's very important that you, know, you understand precisely where, where, where you are. Again, if I go back to the example of Nigeria, with 5,000 tests for 190 million inhabitants, the likelihood that you can have a reliable testing is probably extremely low. Um, and, and that's where you know, it's important. And that's where typically you can see some very important differences in the way the testing has been done in Northern Europe versus Southern Europe, for example. Um, typically, um, a, a country like Germany that has more cases than France has uh, much, much, much less um, casualties um, because they were able to really test and track the patients, whereas the French did not do a lot of testing and probably were flying blind um, at the beginning of the crisis. So, Making sure you establish the triage at the hospital, that you have risk-based protocols, you know, what do I do with the patients, you know, how do I triage them, um, how do I prioritize the testing resources. Most likely, like anywhere in the world, you won't have enough tests. So, you know, you're going to have to figure out, you know, when do I want to test. Um, and you can have different strategies depending on the number of tests that you have. You know, you can decide to, to test only the most severe cases. But some people will argue, well, you know, when they're really severe, there's no question about the fact you know, that they have the COVID-19. Um, so maybe you want to test it on people that have milder um, um, symptoms. Uh, and if you want to make sure whether it's, is it a flu, is it another respiratory syndrome, or is it COVID-19, you know, you may want to do that prioritization. You want to make sure that your tests are accurate enough, you know, as as you know, I mean, having false positive um, uh, or false negative, you know, is, is an issue in both cases. So you want to limit that number. You know it's going to happen, but the real question is, you know, how much do you have uh, that? You know, if you have, we've heard about, you know, tests sent in countries that were uh, accurate only at 60, 70 percent, you know, that is an issue, um, especially when you do massive testing, probably less so in the hospital. I was talking earlier about the um, epi epidemiological models. Actually, you know, beyond the macro model that you do at the country level, it is also very interesting to do models uh, at the, the hospital or at the county level or at the city level. Um, we have been helping a number of health systems in the world, um, in particular the hospitals in Paris, the NHS, um, some private hospital systems in the US, just to plan a few days, unfortunately, you know, we can't do more than a few days ahead, um, just to have an idea of, okay, how many patients are we, are we likely to receive in the next few days? Um, what does that mean in terms of bed? What does that mean in terms of staff? What does that mean in terms of ambulance in, to be able to uh, get the, the patient? What does that mean in terms of call center um, uh, to be able to, uh, to guide the patients and, and answer their questions? Um, so being able to do those models, you know, really help to do in the very short term, you know, help um, plan the hospital demand, but also, you know, how, to, how I get organized uh, around that. You need to, it's a bit theoretical, you know, prepare the, 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 the therapeutic options. Um, let's be honest, at this point in time, you know, we don't have a lot of options. Um, as you know, there are a lot of clinical trials with basically uh, four drugs that are being, being tested, including chloroquine, uh, and a number of more expensive um, antivirals. Um, but, you know, not all of them are completely available and their efficacy is still to be proven. But securing some stock, you know, may make sense um, in the very short term just to make sure that, you know, when you, you're hit by the first wave, you're going to have those treatments available. So that's the preparation. Um, and then, you know, you need to respond, you know, and to respond, the, the first thing we uh, have seen in... Matthew, that there are slides yep. of each one of these seven points coming up, if you want to use them, of these seven points in, in the coming up slides in details, if you do want yep. to use them. 
Absolutely. So we can move to slide 16 to talk about the, um, uh, the crisis response team. Um, the slide in a world will help. Our advice to a CEO of hospitals is to set up such a team. Um, and it's a plurie, uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, one more. Um, it's the one called set up crisis uh, response team. Absolutely. Now, this one is perfect. Um, if you could go to the next slide, sorry, the, the, the one called Set of Crisis Response Team. No, I after that, that, I'm sorry about that. Sorry, yeah, but no, so it, but for the for the benefit yeah. of for the benefit of the attendees, why don't you just take them just for a minute on this that you've talked about this, and then we'll move on. Then I'll bring the seven slides up one by one. Yeah, no, exactly. But, but, but you know, we, we went through this one, Hamid, so you can, you can move to the next one. Um, we well, talked about this one as I well. Think this is, uh, what about this one? Might be good to... Um, yeah, no, so that, that's what I was saying. You know, I mean, today, you know, there are, you know, fundamentally four, four treatments that are um, uh, being uh, tested um, and, and available for use. There are many more uh, products you know that are um in in research but but uh, as you know you know product you know that is in phase zero or phase one you know may not see um uh, the light you know before um several years so you know we're very far from having um all those products in the market what we do have today is um chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine um with a lot of questions right now on the efficacy um of, of that drug um, and as far as I know, the, there are two major clinical trials that are being run right now in Europe. We're expecting the results in the coming weeks. Um, that would be a fantastic news if, if that product proved effective um, because it is widely available. It is well known by, by the physicians. There are some side effects, but they are manageable. Um, but right now, you know, the efficacy is, is far from proven. And, and most importantly, it is a very cheap drug um affordable um then you know we have the classic anti-flu drugs you know we have some hiv drugs that are also being t tested hepatitis uh, c drugs you know also being tested um and just like um, um uh, chloroquine that is sometimes used uh, against arthritis there are also some um, rheumatoid arthritis drugs that are being tested um but again none of them have proven yet their um uh, efficacy. Um, there's been a number of trials, incomplete trials that circulated, uh, but as far as I know, and according to WHO, they're not available. But this one is interesting because that, that's something you should prepare now. It's about, you know, having a response team um, within each hospital, you know, to really figure out, okay, when the wave will hit us, you know, what do we need to do to be ready? Our advice is to create that response team, um, pluridisciplinary, uh, with clinical and non-clinical people. Um, obviously, clinical people because you know you need you need a physician, you need a nurse um, uh, to to make sure that you know the clinical dimension is is well represented in the team. But you also need to make sure that the technology, so that you know we can collect the data very regularly. That if we have to do some models, you know we have access to the data. Um, finance because you know you need to figure out you know how do we um, uh, allocate the resources how do we um, where do we stand on um, on finance um, supply chains how do we make sure that you know, we have the products that are required um, uh, as soon as possible um, and if there are delay um, in supply chain you know how do we cope with that um, so that is very important and the operations just to be um, well organized in terms of operations. The typical things that happen is you're going to need extra beds um, uh, in ICU. So how do you repurpose some uh, department of the hospital, some wings of the hospital to, 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 to prepare that? How do you, you're going to have to get additional staff, you know, the classic thing that we see and that, that we ask is when you have people that were just retired, you know, maybe you call them back. Um, if you have people from a, a nearby hospital that cannot treat those patients and they have extra capacity because actually people don't go, what we observe uh, in Europe is 
people who go to hospital, they do not go necessarily to smaller clinic or primary healthcare center anymore, but you do have nurses there that are available. So how do you make sure that you can use those nurses and bring them back into in your hospital you know, when you're gonna have to do that? Um, what we observed, again, if you look the video, the, all the articles of what is happening in Italy in particular, you know, they were the first hit by the, the, the first wave, um, but later in the east, in eastern part of France, you can see that being prepared, being able to have extra beds, extra ventilators, extra um, equipment, protective equipment, and extra staff was extremely important. So that response team is part of that answer. Um, and then if we move to the, to the next slide, um, you, can, you, you also kind of have you know, the, the surge capacity um, that you know, typically the previous team that we have seen and as I said, you know, you're going to need uh, extra beds, you're going you're gonna to need ward beds, you know, for your staff. Uh, Post-acute care, you know, will be extremely important. Um, uh, outpatient services will have to be reorganized. The more you can do um, telemedicine, the better. Um, so, again, you need to get organized for now, the first line of defense, the second line of defense. And I was saying if we move to the next slide, and that will be my last slide, um, you need to manage um, uh, capacity uh, plan now. Again, when I look at the numbers in Kenya, this seems very reassuring. Um, but but if, if, if they were to go um, in the wrong direction, you need to be ready for that. Um, so you need to increase your workforce. You need to postpone non-essential service, uh, services. Um, you need to, you know, flex your patient per staff ratio. You need to reskill, you know, whenever you can. As I was saying earlier, um, call back the retire um, people or soon to be certified, you know, enroll them earlier than expected. Um, so a lot of things that you can do, and it's probably now just before the wave hits you that, you know, you can be ready for that. Um, and again, working on the the safety of your workforce, um, um, starting to work on communication, um, leveraging digital as much as you can. You know, very happy to go into the details of all those elements, but that phase of preparing and being uh, ready to answer uh, when the, the wave will hit you is, is extremely important. Um, the last slide was the one around uh, managing supply, which is, you know, much more straightforward. Um, uh, you know, I'm sure you, you've done that already, and I'm sure you're struggling with that already. Um, the question is, you know, do you have a B plan? Do you have a C plan when the A plan does not work because your usual supplier will call you and say, sorry, the, the cargo did not land last night, so I don't have the equipment that I promised you. Um, how do you, again, how do you find a plan B? I'll stop here. I know we have a lot to discuss and we want to leave time for questions. Thank you very much, Matthew, for the great overview. Uh, we'll go next to Dr. Amit Faka to hone it down to the Kenya context. Welcome, Amit. Thank you, Thank you Matthew. Thank you, Wala. Thank you, the BCG team. I think you've get a, got a good ground setting as far as what international perspective looks like and how the wave of coronavirus is coming to Kenya. So for the past three weeks, like Dr. Wala mentioned, we've been putting structures together and through KEPSA, and through the private sector, we've been working closely with the Ministry of Health and also the NERC to ensure that we build a strong defensive shield. What we did, like we've set up many groups, this is one of the groups that we've set up, especially for this webinar. And this is the Kenya COVID-19 hospital network. This group has been very supportive. We've got great, great ideas. And many of you who have logged in as CEOs, CFOs, and senior executives will be getting information that we will take forward to try and make it even stronger. This is not the time, I think, for competition. It's a time for collaboration. It's a time that we need to work together. That's the only way we're going to deal with the high numbers that Matthew spoke about, because it will rip apart any health system in the world. So what we need to do in Nairobi, Mombasa, and Kenya is to make it strong enough so we get as few seeping cases that affect the rest of the economy. I'll talk about six areas that I think would be really important for the hospitals and the healthcare institutions to take advantage of 
and also to work in collaboration. One is HRH, supply chain and ICT on this slide. We, we got quite a few CVs, we've given it to the government. We've got 10 trainers. What our priority activities are in human resources right now is protection of all hospital staff. And I urge you, all the leaders of healthcare facilities, give PPEs uh, to your health workers, train the hospital staff, and also have continuous learning, including ongoing webinars. There are too many webinars, too many conversations happening everywhere. Try and focus to those that's going to help your staff, going to help your doctors, going to help your nurses, and going to help your administration. And then we need to open it up to repurpose other organizations like Kenya Airways are very happy to engage with us on bringing hospitality and food service uh, into the hospital so that when you are actually fully stretched and you don't know what to do with catering and hospitality to your staff, we could repurpose. What we need from you is um, FBOs really need more healthcare workers. So we need to support the faith-based organizations. We need to scale up uh, training and we need to empower health workers and keep them safe. And for this, Dr. Walla is going to take a full uh, part of action and we will be able to report to you some more progress by the time we meet next in two weeks. In supply chain, comprehensive list. I guess the main issue we were trying to coordinate here was, could we get a pooled procurement system through KEMSA or through MEDS? And it's clear that MEDS is also struggling to get as many PPs like all of you in your hospitals or your facilities. And KEMSA too has been getting a few PPEs, but not enough. So I think for the private sector, you're on your own to look for providers and suppliers. We have to quickly pick up which ones are approved because some poor quality PPEs may not serve the purpose. So we have a list on our website. Please go and visit it. It's PPB Cabs approved. We are hoping that we get more local manufacturers coming up to the mark and we have more reliable suppliers so that we avoid these price hikes. All of you know what you were buying gloves at or even masks. And now look at the pack of 50 from moving from about 400 to 500 to two, 3,000 shillings. And our call out there to everyone is don't take advantage of this COVID situation to just make profit. Streamlined procurement is another point we're going to work this week on and we're going to create a supply chain planning dashboard and hopefully we'll have pooling and sharing of supplies both local and imported. So we will help the hospitals share with each other who they think is a good supplier. What we need from you is um, what do you want literally and I think the email address that you all know of and write to us what you're looking for. What do you really want? And where do you think we can help you? Because if you don't speak and don't share, we'll never get to know. It's business unusual. Also share the supply list and cost. This is not an error that you're going to be a winner because you know who the supplier is or you're the winner because you did it first. There's no race. Nobody's racing in COVID-19. Neither are any hospitals, whether public or private. The only way you can save your staff and the patients is if you work together in a team, totally shoulder to shoulder. Reporting mechanisms for private sector must improve so that we have visibility. And I think this is where KHF is gonna play a role. For ICT and mobile health, I think this is giving a new birth to a new kind of enterprise within the health sector. The telehealth providers must scale up and if you haven't started practicing telehealth providers in your hospital or your facility, the time is right now. We want to see how many consultations you've done using telehealth. We do want even Kenyans to start practicing telemedicine. You do know that you don't need to go to a bank to bank. You don't need to go to a shop to shop. You don't need to go to a clinic to get advice and maybe even treatment for healthcare. The less we have movement, the better we will have our efforts being seen in flattening the curve. The priority for us is um, really around enabling hospitals to have these services. And digital health will definitely play a big role in flattening the curve. What we've been able to get is with some people, and we've been talking to Safaricom as well, to try and get internet services. We've got one offer 
of free internet services by Dimension Data. I have shared it with the hospital CEO group and I'm sure the Dimension Data are getting requests. We also want to have remote psychosocial support. We have a call center, 1196, that we have trained about 50 staff already and we want to increase more. So if you do have ideas to increase our call center to do more work, uh, please come forward, develop a platform to connect hospital with donors. There are many people out there who might be willing to donate PPEs and supplies. Uh, you are the first ones that should benefit from this. Issues we need support from you is um, go by the law, look at the regulations, have a conducive environment, don't break the law and work within the confines of the law. If there are changes you need for the law, write to us. We have a legal team that's tweaking the Public Health Act, suggestions being given, and create a telehealth referral system so that a gastroenterologist can treat a GP clinic patient in Neri and does not need to travel. Same can happen with a dermatological case in Mombasa that needs somebody in Eldoret to have a look at. This is the time we have to now think of the new normal on how hospitals and clinics operate. The three other areas I want to mention quickly that we want to offer to you and so that you can also provide support to us is on the partnership communication resource mobilization. What we are doing is we are advocating and lobbying to the Kenya COVID fund led by one of our private sector champions, Jane Karuku, and you know many people on the fund, for, to tell them for every 100 shillings in phase one, 80 shillings must go to the health sector, whether it is protection, PPEs, whether it is reagents and tests, whether it is support for bills in hospitals and ambulance and emergencies, that's all important. That's without that phase, other support like airlines and tourism and um, uh, other industries like agriculture, we can support them in phase two. If you have hotels, those who are here and guest houses, please come forward and offer it to us. I want to thank the hotel keepers, the Kenya Tourism Federation, and many of the hotels such as uh, the new Stanley Hotel, for example, and others who've said, use our hotels, guest houses to accommodate healthcare workers so they don't have to go back and forth from the hospitals, helping us to flatten the curve. Uh, little cabs, Uber Bolt, we've got many people offering transport services. We want to prioritize uh, our partnership with the medical gases team and critical care groups that's going on, develop a central database for donations and in-kind support. And we want to follow up with corporates, high net worth individuals, diaspora, celebrities to scale up support to hospitals and facilities. You are the primary group that should receive the first dollar to ensure our defense is strong. What we need from you is if there is a hotel or a guest house that the private sector is willing to offer, we need you as hospitals to tell us you have people who are trained or have been trained by MOH and you can now go and train the support staff. Otherwise they are very scared of any housekeeping or catering staff to be um, in contact with high risk populations such as your doctors and nurses who will be staying there. Uh, we need on who has been approached by donors, well wishers, let us know so that we can have a wider reach. If you don't and cannot absorb the kind of donation or support you have been hearing, just channel it to us. We will make sure it goes to the right place. There is a call out by the Ministry of Health of returning underutilized medical cylinders. So if you are sitting on an empty cylinder and it could save a life of somebody in a different facility, I think this is business unusual that you might need to really embrace. On regulations, quality and standards, again, familiarize yourself with all the guidelines on quarantine, on isolation, on infection prevention control. These are all over the place. If you have a problem, contact us. They are available for you. There will soon be an approved list of isolation centers. I don't know whether it's already out. But while I, I don't know whether the medical practitioners there in this board council have already put it up, but these isolation centers are increasing 
and they are going to be regional in every county in order for us to uh, make sure that the positive cases are appropriately managed. The partnership with architects, surveyors, planners is in advanced stages. They will be talking to KU presenting as well as Bagathi and KNH on infrastructure innovations. These designs are available for you at no cost. These professionals are available for you to repurpose your buildings at no cost. You can also have your annex done in such a way so you don't put your staff at risk and other patients at risk. Take advantage of these professionals. We are also looking at locally manufactured ICU beds, which you know that uh, was um, visited by Dr. Wala and CS Betty Minor. And we want to ensure that this is also available for you. And you shouldn't be not be able to take patients because of lack of equipment, beds, mattresses, and such kind of uh, overarching structures. Our priority is to train the staff in quarantine facilities. Uh, there's been a, been a lot of uh, mismanagement and it hasn't been appropriately managed from the time we got travelers in 2000 odd, but we learned on the job like, you know, Corona is teaching everyone many things every day and also Kenya is learning along this journey. We'll advocate for regulatory policy changes on telehealth, tax relief, fund distribution, especially to the hospitals, especially to the doctors, especially to your staff. Um, we are working with KH Poa and KMPDC on dissemination of appropriate information. Webinars and regulators will get regulators as well as a speaker. So we urge all hospitals to adopt appropriate practices and to avoid compromise. Literally, what would be really unfair is when the virus starts spreading within the hospital if it becomes an epicenter. You, as hospital and health facility champions, are supposed to reduce transmission and do whatever it takes. And you have more expertise than anyone else in the country in keeping the transmission chain down. That's the weak point. And if we don't practice IPC, then it will start seeping and we want as few health workers getting infected as possible. We've seen the numbers in the other countries. We want to also urge you to flag any difficulties and bring them to us in advance so that we can prepare ahead. And this is why the hospital preparedness and the healthcare sector preparedness webinar is on a timely stage today. A lot of questions on healthcare financing. Literally, are we gonna get broke? If the private hospitals get broke and bankrupt, it's going to damage the first line shield. Then our numbers are gonna shoot up even faster. It's one of the reasons why the surge will happen in communities, in, um, in groupings and through patients. This is a real situation. We've seen it in USA. We've seen it in other countries. For this, the funding support should come from NHIF. It should also be from the Kenya COVID Fund. And we should ask all well-wishers that this is your first dollar support. I know food is important. Maybe we are competing with food and survival when we have a lockout suppression and a lockdown model. But I can tell you, if the hospitals don't get support and you don't get support, your payroll and your supplies and your treatment protocols may receive a dent and that dent will create the gap that we're all trying to release. We want to develop a risk allowance fund called the hazard payout. Uh, that has happened in many countries. You will see in the next slide where this has happened. And also obtain NHIF to pay quicker. We were told that the three billion was paid by them after we managed to have a discussion with the CEO. One of our board members now has been propped up as a CEO, we hope all the parliamentary procedures go through. It's really good for us. I would really urge those on the call to support the movement and the appointment of Dr. Kamunya as a CEO in this timely uh, stage. Write to the pri uh, private and FBO hospitals to share pending bills from both private insurance and public insurance, and eventually develop a tripartite payment model. It's a tripod. This tripod, will be the tripod on which financing for healthcare and hospitals will rest. Three main people 
will be the insurers, the second will be providers, and the third will be the government. The government must chip in to support hospitals. So should all the corporates and insurers and payers. And the third is you providers must also play a role in reducing costs of care where necessary. Avoid any waste, avoid any jacking up prices where you think you can stitch up and be more efficient and look at all possibilities of not transferring markups that may damage either the entire healthcare financing chain or leave Kenyans high and wide with higher COVID outbreaks. So the appeal is each hospital must think of reducing cost of care and uh, suggestions on innovative financing should be also provided. I've had calls with many people who are thinking of loans, first loss schemes, advance uh, cash bailouts. Uh, these are suggestions that we welcome uh, from all the hospitals very clearly. Let's talk about payment because it's really a big <clears throat> discussion by most of the CEOs. And this is the reason why we met the CS of Health together with the Deputy Minister and the CEO of NHIF about payments. Um, we would like to appeal to Aki to actually waive the exclusion of pandemic on all policy pro holders in Kenya as a blanket statement. Some of the insurers have done it. We want to do business unusual. I also understand the insurers have to cater for their income and expense, but this is a time where each party must take a bite to make the COVID financing system work. Look at what's happened in South Africa and look what happened in Morocco. These insurance companies have come onto the stage to support patients who have a cover. NHIF has already told us they only cover the patient and not the disease, so it's very clear. Uh, but ICU costs can be really high and ventilation costs can be very high. So besides that, the hazard payments for doctors would provide a moral booster and also the much needed support for the families. If there are any people here who are employing health workers or health workers who are listening on this, you definitely are the heroes in the front line. You've seen claps in UK and NHS whenever there is an opportunity. We need to start a total campaign by hospitals, healthcare facilities, and doctors, nurses to start this campaign that healthcare workers matter. In fact, they are the front line and we need to provide them with a hazard payout. We need to look at jacking up their salaries. We need to support their homes. We need to support their families. We need to provide food for them. This is the true frontline army for us. And here is an illustration of what's happened in India and what's happened not too far from us, and that's Ghana. So we can also make this happen and pay them uh, some kind of a compensation. I'll stop here and hand it over to Dr. Wala. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Amit, for honing it down. I know we've taken a bit of time, but we needed to dig deep into what the Kenyan context is, and you've provided a very good feedback on that. So I open it to questions and answers. Um, I'll read a few that are on my side, the Q&A. Again, to our audience, you are currently muted just to control the, the, the conversation in terms of um, interruptions. But uh, on your bottom side of the screen, we have a Q&A session that you can either chat your question there or on the chat side where we have both Dr. Anastasia and myself uh, having a keen eye on it. So to our panelists, I think I would like to direct one or two questions. There's some that are hospital specific and there are others that are really uh, general questions. So feel free to, to answer as fast as we can. Now, the first one is from, um, Ewa Mayo, who's saying we'd like to understand what Kenya is doing to ensure that hospitals are not only prepared for COVID-19, but also for routine services. So we've heard in the news about uh, 
patients still dying from malaria and uh, a mother who lost her baby. So what can we do to ensure there's that we are still supporting routine services? Um, there's a question on what Kenya's plan on testing, and they know this should be directed to the Ministry of Health, but Dr. Amit, feel free to plug into that. And then the third one I will pick is on um, Dr. Pauline Gitonga talking about what's our government strategy for non-symptomatic cases. So currently, everyone who's positive is being directed to a health facility. Is this feasible? So we want to, her question is, uh, what, would, what should we be doing for the non-symptomatic cases when we start mass testing? So answer those three, please, and then we can go to the next three. Um, Hamid, I'm, I'm happy to, to take the, the first and the last one, if that's fine with you. Why don't you go ahead, Matthew, with that? And uh, uh, Mills, also welcome to this room. Uh, go ahead, Matthew. Thanks. Yeah. So on the first one, you know, I think it's it's extremely important. You know, you're absolutely right. Um, and the idea of flattening the curve is to be able to answer to COVID emergencies, but also any other emergency. So that means that, you know, when you prepare the response, you need to be able to do both. Um, and then the, the non-urgent, uh, you know, typically elective surgery, you know, hip or knee replacement, you know, those type of things, those ones can be postponed. Um, you could also imagine that, you know, when you have cases, you know, that are, let's say, you know, you're in an hospital, you know, you're able to treat, you know, very complex cases um, and you have a patient, you know, that is not a complex patient, you know, maybe you could send him um, to another facility that does not have your capacity, does not have your level. So that's the triage that I was mentioning earlier. You know, it is important for COVID and for, for non-COVID. So, so, so that is very, very important. And for me, that, that's really part of the, of the preparedness. When it comes to the non-symptomatic cases, you know, when you start mass testing, I mean, first, you know, in, before you can actually do mass test testing um, with, with enough test kits, uh, you know, it may take a while, but assuming, you know, you get there, um, then, you know, you have multiple choices. You know, the, the most logical choice is the choices that have been made in, in Korea or in China, which is basically to quarantine people to tra trace their contact. So, and quarantine can be several types of quarantine. You know, you can have the self-quarantine situation that is the, the, the most widespread. You can be stricter than that by quarantining people in a hotel typically and, and people cannot move. So, you know, they're separated from their, from their family. Uh, that's what China has done uh, in Wuhan. Um, you know, then people may argue that, you know, we, we may not want to do that type of thing because our population is not ready for that and or we we're not willing to pay for that. Um, but for me, that's here again, that's a political question. Um, it may be perceived as infringing people's freedom, but some countries have decided to do that. Um, and, and again, you know, it has some effect and it goes back to the trade off that I was mentioning um, men mentioning earlier. Uh, and then, you know, once you've identified those people, the, the question is, in an ideal world, you know, you would trace all their contact to test their, the, the, the contact and the people, you know, they've been interacting with, just so that, you know, you can um, um, eliminate um, a cluster, you know, at a given point. We have some examples where it has been done. Taiwan has done it. Um, there are some very specific places where early in the epidemic, it was done in France um, and in Germany. Now that the virus is widespread, you know, it, it's very hard to do. Uh, but early in the, in the process, it's very important. Uh, I'll stop here. Excellent. Um, Walla, well, could you just repeat that second question for me? The one, was it about testing? Yeah, so there are a couple of questions on testing. So one is, what, what, what is our plan as a country for testing? And number two, do we only limit it to people who have a positive travel? And uh, number three, what, what do we do when we have a shortage of tests? Basically uh, around the testing ecosystem. It's a very, very good question. And I can tell you, like anywhere in the world, we had really big shortages of testing. We had a time when we didn't have swabs. But there was a time we didn't have media. There was a time when we were overwhelmed. But all those little things have been managed. And there's also the good news that we've got the Roche uh, testing kits which are being calibrated now as we speak so the 6500 tests will be up and about so the tests are up 
the people in Camry and the National Lab, they've done wonderful work. Those are, those are the boys we should give kudos to. Um, what is uh, now the plan is to ramp up the testing. At the lab, we can probably do up, up to 2,000 a day. I hope if we multiply these labs and have more labs doing it, we can do up to 10, 20,000 a day. But I think the big challenge we have is the manpower. You have to literally go to the patient, pick the swab, and then take the media and take it to the lab. We need to ramp up the manpower. Who are we testing? I think we're testing what I think Kenya considers high risk. So the travelers were the biggest ones. We needed 2,000 tests done. They're all done. Today was the last batch. Um, they're also testing people who are symptomatic and uh, report through the call center like 719. And the other is the contact tracing. Now, this is the current phase. When, the, when we are overwhelmed, you heard Matthew and you've heard from other countries that if you are not symptomatic and if you have it or not, you might be recovering at home because we'll have no space. But the way to flatten the curve now is real pressure then the pressure of contact tracing. And when you are contact traced and you're being requested for testing or quarantine, the Kenyans should comply. That's the way and that should be the responsibility. I hope, Wala, that answers the question. Yes, uh, there are two questions for you, Dr. Amit. One is, um, uh, with regards to Kenya Healthcare Federation, I think the list of hospitals you put up, they seem to be focusing a lot on uh, cities. Is it that we are biased towards the cities that we're seeing cases like in CIA and Mandera where we may not have very strong private facilities? The second question is on how do we strengthen public-private partnerships during this time? Yeah. Basically looking at private sector supporting uh, public. And then the last one is on health workers. Yeah. How do we ensure that they are motivated? How do we ensure that they, they're working in very extreme circumstances? Uh, yeah. what, is, what are we doing towards those? Yeah. Look, um, we started at Nairobi City. It's because it was easier to get them. I've written an email. Dr. Wala is here. Anastasia is here. Please write to us. We would love to have everybody in those seven or eight counties where we have already cases to start bringing them on board, build capacity, do this kind of webinars and train them every public or private facility that is out there. We only started Nairobi because the largest number of cases I believe are here and will remain here. So we need a stronger shield. But Mombasa hospitals, Mandera, Kilifi, please come on board. The second one was, we are an envy to many African countries, ladies and gentlemen, to be honest. And not only Africa, but maybe globally, the PPP that we have, the communication that we have with the Ministry of Health and also to the office of the president is pretty good. Now, it may not be perfect, the PPP, but the communication and relationship is great. Take an example when we had a quarantine uh, dissatisfaction and many Kenyans were upset. We had to bring Dr. Onyancha, who came on a webinar to clarify things. Now, their communication as government may not be first class but we need to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. So the PPP is being tested right now as we speak. And if there is any chain of the PPP that breaks, it's going to literally let the virus seep in even further. So, so far, so good. We as a private sector are doing our part. You as the attendee, wherever you are, you do your part. The third one is healthcare workers. Really, I think all our hearts go out to the doctors, nurses, and all the workers who are there. How do we motivate and bring morale? Look, the hazard payout risk allowance is one, accommodation, food, family support, social support. But I think the biggest thing that's going to change a health worker's morale is the employer. Whoever is the employer and the leader of the CEO is going to make the difference. If they're going to give these health workers empty promises that we are protecting you, then I think we should hold that CEO uh, fully responsible. If they're going to give them empty promises that you guys go in the front, I'll support you from the back. We're going to hold those guys responsible. Leadership of CEOs and the administrators of hospital is being tested today. We will differentiate who literally cares for the staff or who are just glossing over to say we are trying to do what we can. Repurpose your finance team repurpose your pledges. Let's see letters flowing in. If you can't really look after the healthcare workers yourself, ask for help because we're not going to give you a second chance because that's the reason 
why healthcare workers feel motivated. Sometimes it's PPE, it's a bit of morale boosting, and it may be actual financial and social protection. That's the game changer for Kenya. I hope okay. that answers that. Yes, I'll, I'll request my, my audience to indulge just five more minutes to just cover the last set of questions. Um, one is on um, the training. Um, is the training coordinated centrally? Do we have, what is our role as MOH or uh, KHF? The second one is on the supply chain. Uh, Liz feels that uh, we sh it's a bit of an overkill to ask business people to reduce prices of commodities that are already very high out there. So we should instead be encouraging local production of um, the, 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 the products. Um, then there's a question on telemedicine and whether we have the regulatory environment. Um, who is the, who's holding that? And last but not least, we have a question on the oxygen cylinders and the request to hospitals who are listening in is that they should continue cleaning the cylinders before they return them for refilling. So one is a comment and the other is a question. Thank you. So clean the cylinders before you give them. That's a straightforward comment. Um, the issue of the, the question from Liz was about supply chain. Is she saying it's getting expensive out here with the supply? Walla, what did she, what was the question? Yeah, I can, she said, I you know, on that one. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. You, yeah. Mills, so she ahead. had said, we, mm -hmm. we are requesting them to reduce their prices if they're the, the suppliers, yet they're also sourcing them out there at a very yeah. high cost. Yeah. Yeah. So we should, you should encourage local production, but uh, Matthew, go ahead. Oh, no, sorry. This is Mills. I, I was just going to say, I mean, I think, I, I, I mean, I think people are encouraging local production, you know, quite extensively. And I think that's a big role that KHF and CAPSA have played to date, uh, helping to identify the need around things like PPEs, um, uh, you know, sanitizers, et cetera, which are starting to be produced by people that weren't producing them a number of months ago. I, I do think that there's an incremental view which says that in an environment like this, you know, where sure, you know, the laws of supply and demand would dictate that there's an opportunity to raise price when you have so many people contributing, um, you know, time, effort, money uh, on a pro bono basis that, you know, there's sort of a moral imperative to not, um, you know, charge rent in excess of, of what is actually being earned. And I think that's the, that's the point I, I was making, which for what it's worth, I agree with. Yeah, so that answers most of the questions. Walla, did we miss any? Yeah, the telemed tel telemedicine. Yeah. Telemedicine so, is a, I yeah, guess. Yeah, the regulatory environment. Yeah, yeah, look, it's a non-negotiable issue. Telemedicine is going to come whether the regulators want it or not. So the regulators will probably have to take extra pace and it'll be a marathon for them. All I know is we are at advanced stages. Uh, Turuti, who is leading our team there, Walla, I think, is at the final stages of approval. Yes, we need, we need regulation because at this point, I think you will get all cowboys trying to set up telemedical providers and say, pay me by M-Pesa before you do a consultation. So having some licensing will bring some sanity, but I don't think it'll be perfect. It's non-negotiable, it's coming. Great, so thank you so much and thank you for listening in. This was just an overview looking at uh, the global landscape. We thank Mr. Matthew from Boston Consulting Group. We thank uh, Mills and Sisi who are also from BCG and Dr. Amit. Thank you our audience. We'll have the session recorded and posted on our platforms. And uh, if you need to reach us, uh, our email address is COVID19, C-O-V-I-D-1-9 at khf.co.ke. We'll have, uh, we can respond to any of the other questions that we may not have tackled or any other inquiry. Uh, we want to wish you a lovely evening. We'll uh, see you next time. Keep, keep uh, updated on, from our platform on various webinars and we're going to delve deeper. The next webinar for this will have um, our local hospitals now participating and giving us their experience. So thank you very much and have a lovely evening.